We often hear about the Sunni-Shia divide today in media coverage about conflict or political situations in the Middle East. One sort of gets the impression of a perpetual war between two branches of Islam, and often with very little nuance. When these branches are explained or, or talked about by experts or journalists or in videos here on YouTube, they often present a simplified version of the historical and contemporary differences, often boiling it down to an event that happened after the death of Muhammad. But as you might expect at this point, it is a lot more complicated than this. So what are are the differences between the Shia and the Sunni, and how did they come about? So as you may have heard, the story begins arguably with the death of the Prophet Muhammad in 632 AD. This event sort of sent shockwaves through the entire community and immediately they started discussions on who should succeed him. There was one group, one camp, who believed that his close friend Abu Bakr should be the first Khalifa or Caliph. Um, but not everyone agreed. There was another group who believed that his cousin and son-in-law Ali was the rightful heir. Um, the first group who favored Abu Bakr sort of won this uh, argument and he became the first in a line of four uh, so-called rightly guided caliphs followed by Omar, Uthman and eventually Ali himself and who were all elected by a kind of semi-democratic process you could say. This first group who favored Abu Bakr we could call the proto-Sunnis. It is this group who would later become the Sunni. Um, the other group who favored Ali was often called the Shi'at Ali, which means the party of Ali. And this is where the word Shia comes from. And this is usually where the story ends for a lot of people. That this divide is simply a difference in the succession of Muhammad and that it kind of ends there. Um, but there's a lot more to this story. Over the following decades and centuries, there would be great conflicts of authority who should lead the Muslim community. Um, we can't really talk about a Sunni versus Shia conflict here because these two distinct groups hadn't even emerged yet in that sense. Um, there were many proto-Sunni groups like the Umayyad and Abbasid dynasties that you've probably heard of and many other that would compete for who should be the rightful leader. There were also the descendants of Muhammad and Ali, the Shia, who, who favored or sort of their idea was that the rightful leader of the Muslim community uh, should belong exclusively to the Prophet's family, his descendants in the line of Ali. To the Shia, Ali was the first so-called Imam, both a worldly and spiritual successor to Muhammad, who had been given the secrets to understand and interpret the religion correctly. After Ali, there is thus a line of imams that will succeed him as, as imams, as leaders, which begins with his son Hassan and then Hussein. Now, Hussein started a kind of revolt against the early Umayyad dynasty and was very famously martyred and killed by Umayyad forces in Karbala. This is a very important event to Shia Muslims and is, is commemorated every year in a, in a festival or a, or a day called Ashura. After Hussein, his son became the next imam, and then his son, and then his son, and so on. Most of these imams favored a kind of quietist approach, to generalize, living somewhat secluded lives with their group of followers, despite often being persecuted by the Umayyad and later Abbasid caliphs as a threat to their leadership. The proto-Sunnis and later Sunnis were led by the caliphs, leaders who had mostly worldly secular power, although some of the earlier caliphs did call themselves imams too, and did wield significant religious authority. As many of you know, these include the caliphs of the dynasties I mentioned, like the Umayyad and Abbasid empires. Now, because things insist on always being complicated, the Shia, so-called, branch isn't a homogenous group either. In fact, they're divided into many branches of their own. Already by the fifth imam, or after the fourth, there appeared a conflict of succession on who the next imam should be. And there was one group who favored a, a guy called Zaid ibn Ali, uh, who became the, the Zaidis, the Zaidi Shia, or the, also known as the Fiver Shia. And these are still alive today and make up a significant portion of the population in Yemen. 
And then, a while later, there appeared another conflict of succession in the first sort of line by the fifth or sixth, depending on who you ask, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. There were some who favored his oldest son, Ismail ibn Jafar, who became known as the Ismailis, or Sevener Shias, which is the second largest group of Shiites today. Another faction rather viewed his younger son, Musa al-Kazim, to be the rightful successor, and these became known as the Ithna Ashari, or Twelver Shia, sometimes also called the Imami Shia, and this is, this is the largest group today. It is the Twelver form of Shiism that is dominant in Iran today, and it's the state religion of Iran. The Ismailis, on the other hand, is quite complicated too. They eventually established the Fatimid dynasty and further developed into more branches, the Nizari and Musta'li Ismailis. The former is the largest of these, and is the only group of Shia who still have a living Imam in Aga Khan IV. The latter group is represented by a group called the Boras, who exists primarily in India today. My reason for retelling this general history is to point out that the Shia is not a homogenous group, and neither are the Sunnis. We shouldn't therefore view history as this kind of clear dichotomy between t these two Sunni versus Shia in some kind of conflict, because this divide, uh, these, th this grouping didn't exist historically in the way that we conceive of it today. Okay, so historical facts aside, we should also recognize that since the Sunni and Shia often had completely different ideas about authority, this of course affected their um, sort of doctrines and ideas too. Not only was this sort of divide political early on, it also eventually became philosophical, theological, and legalistic. And because the Shia and Sunni viewed different companions of Muhammad as more or less trustworthy, this also affected greatly the, the transmission of hadith, the stories about the Prophet and his companions. So the Sunni and Shia often used different collections of hadith from each other, which is also the basis of much Islamic law and ritual. Not only that, but the Shias also view the hadith of the Imams as authoritative, and not just those of Muhammad. And these hadiths are also frequently used in legal matters as well. As time went by, theological differences appeared too. Generally, one could say that the more rationalistically based theological school of the Mu'atazila, which eventually became a minority in the Sunni world, was adopted to a much larger degree by the Shiites, especially by the Twelver and Zaidi branches. The Mu'atazila favored a more sort of metaphorical and allegorical reading of scripture and had a more transcendent view of God without any anthropomorphic features, for example. The Mu'tazila school was quite popular early on for the Sunnis as well, but soon thereafter it lost its prominence to another school called Asharism, a more literalist approach, which is still the mainstream today. The Ismailis in turn went in their own direction. Heavily inspired by Neoplatonic philosophy, their theology is very unique in this context, having very different ideas about revelation and metaphysics, for example, and features many esoteric aspects. When it comes to the question of fiqh or jurisprudence, there are differences here too. Uh, while the Sunnis eventually developed to gradually discard things like personal rational efforts by the jurist in favor of the revealed sources like the Quran, Hadith, and analogy, and, 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 and so on, the Shia, one could say generally, has maintained the importance of something called ijtihad, which could be translated as personal interpretation or personal effort to interpret while they didn't like things like analogy as much as the Sunnis did. When talking about the Sunni world, it is often stated that the door to Ijtihad closed around the year 1000, and this, of course, isn't true at all, since the people still kept interpreting and are still interpreting today, um, but that's a subject for another video. We should remember that these are huge generalizations, and that I'm speaking primarily from a historical perspective. In fact, the concept of Ijtihad has very much resurfaced in the Sunni world, especially in the last two centuries, with the emergence of certain reform movements like what is often called Islamic modernism, in which people have started to reinterpret and use ijtihad again to reinterpret the original sources like the Quran, which has led to everything from Islamic feminism to Al-Qaeda. So the Sunni schools of law, the madhabs, which are the Hanafi, the Shafi, the Maliki, and the Hanbali, are independent and different from the various Shia schools. The, the, the Twelver school of, of jurisprudence is often referred to as the Jafari school. The Zaidi school is called the Zaidi school, and the Ismailis have the Ismaili school. Very simple. Of course, the Ismailis, at least the Nizari Ismailis, still have a living Imam, which means that he still has the highest authority and last word when it comes to interpreting the Quran and derive or adapt its laws to current society. In fact, this is one of the main doctrines of Shiism. The Shia Imams are not simply worldly leaders of the Muslim community, they are the spiritual leaders and authority as well. 
It is thought that Ali was given the inner secrets to interpret the Quran, a spiritual wisdom that he handed over to the next Imam, who handed it over to the next, and so on. To the Shia, the Quran isn't complete in that sense, but must always be interpreted and understood by the living Imams, the descendants of the Prophet himself. The Sunnis, on the other hand, while the early caliphs did have some authority over religious matters and the law, this authority eventually fizzled out and they became more secular leaders, religious matters then being dealt with by groups of jurists, theologians, and to some degree Sufis, Sufi sheikhs. We should remember to avoid viewing this divide as some two clear factions that are at perpetual war or something. Uh, there were conflicts, of course, and the minority group was often persecuted and oppressed by the majority. These are just a few of the multitude of different perspectives and ideas that existed within the larger Muslim community. Many Sunnis were inspired by Shias and vice versa. I would argue that there didn't appear a clear Sunni versus Shia dichotomy as we think of it today until the rise of the so-called gunpowder empires in the early modern period. That is, let's say, between the 16th and 18th or 19th centuries. So on the one hand we had the Ottoman Empire who ruled large portions of the Middle East from Istanbul, who were predominantly Sunni, and then uh, on the other hand we had what is in modern Iran, uh, the Safavid Empire, whose state religion was Twelver Shiism. And so here for the first time we have two empires, one who is very clearly Sunni and the other Shia and who were not always on the best of terms. These empires and the culture and religion practiced there were often very distinct from each other, to the point that they can sometimes feel like completely different religions. Uh, for example, in Shia Safavid Empire, Sufism began to be viewed in a very suspicious light. Many of the jurists of the Safavid Empire were very opposed to Sufism and it was often persecuted, um, which is especially weird since the, the Safavids were founded by and named after a Sufi order, the Safaviyya. And this stands in stark contrast to the two other Sunni empires, the Ottomans and the Mughals, both in which Sufism flourished. This negative stance towards Sufism that started during the Safavid dynasty has left its mark even today, as many of the Sufi orders in Iran, like the Nimatullahi order, is severely oppressed still today. So even though the gunpowder empires don't exist anymore, its effect can very much still be felt. The lands that were ruled by Ottoman and Mughal empires are still dominated by Sunnis in terms of population. In contrast, Iran and the larger Persian region has a majority of Shiites. With the emergence of the nation-state system, these conflicts aren't as clear as they were back then, although there clearly are still tensions, as we can see today in the region. Thus, what is important to remember is that the big Shia-Sunni tension that we see today isn't that old either. It has really only become worse in the last 70 years or so, with the increase of divisive politics in the Middle East and the subsequent spread of fundamentalist groups. Also important to remember is that a lot of groups and religious leaders from both sides of the spectrum are working hard today to establish a religious unity between these two groups and solidarity. There's a lot of examples of this kind of syncretism both in the contemporary world and also historically. To conclude, the difference between the Sunni and Shia are not simply a question of the succession after Muhammad. This initial division led to many other developing distinctions between the two. They often differ on how the Quran should be interpreted or even conceived. They have different views on authority, their theologies have developed in different directions, they often use different collections of hadith by different narrators, and thus the laws or the sharia and rituals often differ. They celebrate distinct holidays, like the Ashura in, in the case of the Shia. The doctrines of the Imams is also a significant distinction, as is the more prominent focus on Tawil in Shiism. And as we've seen, the Shia themselves are also divided into multiple branches that are often very distinct from each other as well, as are the many branches within Sunnism. There are even differences in very central sort of ideas and concepts, like the so-called Five Pillars of Islam. While the Sunnis and Twelvers have five pillars, the Ismailis actually have seven. So as you can see, the differences are often much larger and significant than we are led to believe. But at the same time, and as I've stated multiple times in this video, we should also avoid drawing too clear a dichotomy between these two groups, as if they were like the Catholic or Orthodox churches in, in medieval times, uh, or these two branches that are constantly at perpetual war. Instead, history has shown a complicated myriad of schools and ideas that have sometimes been in opposition to each other. There have been periods in history, like right now or during the gunpowder empires, where the division appears much more prominent, and other periods and places where it hasn't been. Everything I've said in this video is of course generalizations too, 
Um, but I hope I've given you a bit more nuanced and complex view of these two movements within Islam. Um, let me know what you think, and, uh, and uh, please correct me if I have made any uh, serious mistakes. Uh, I'll see you next time.